Well, it's my great privilege today to welcome Marilyn McIntyre with us. She's a visiting professor at CDSP, and uh, she's also uh, uh, been working uh, in the area of uh, theology, medicine, and the arts for 25 years. She's an author of several books uh, in this area. Uh, she and her husband, a Presbyterian minister, uh, were members of St. John's for a time before they moved away. Uh, and of course, he retired <laughs> as a minister. And uh, we've been very fortunate at St. John's that uh, Marilyn has returned to uh, uh, lead several retreats. So uh, welcome, Marilyn. Thank you. What a pleasure to be back, sort of. Well, what where would you like to start in, in talking about what you've gleaned from all this research on medicine and the arts and theology and, and how uh, it, it uh, resonates with what we're all uh, facing uh, right now? Well, I think the medical literature that's most pertinent right now, of course, is the literature of plagues and epidemics and public health. And that goes all the way back, as you know, into the Old Testament and beyond. Um, I looked at a timeline of plagues to refresh my memory. And as far as you can tell from most historical accounts, there have been major plagues and epidemics in every single recorded century. So epidemic is just one of the things human communities have, often, have always lived with. What's interesting to me is that in the known history that we have, almost every major epidemic has produced a body of literature, not just medical writing, but plays and poetry and story. And it seems as though that's almost a necessary way for the community to get a handle on what's going on. And so I think it's an interesting way to look at medical history. How have people processed what's happening to a whole community? So in the course that I used to teach on uh, medicine and literature, we always had a section on plagues, epi epidemics, and public health. And we would start sometimes with the Old Testament story of Naaman or the plagues in Egypt and the ways in which the Jews were blamed by the Egyptians and look at some of the issues that come up there. And then the Iliad starts with a plague and in the Middle Ages, the Decameron starts with a plague and Milton's Paradise Lost the 11th chapter is a whole history of the humanity told in terms of the plagues that have been visited upon us for our sins and on and on. So this connection between sin and sickness and war and faith has been a constant in all of this literature. How it's the, and the literature itself, I regard as a testimony to the way people have come to terms with what's going on among them. Well, I mean, that uh, raises this question that's uh, right before us where people are referring to this as a, as a Chinese virus and the racism right. and uh, that, that has come out of this. And uh, this almost need uh, sometimes when people are facing a difficult time uh, to blame somebody. Um, right. What are your thoughts about that? Well, that has been a constant in these stories about um, plagues and epidemics. For instance, in one of my favorite plague stories is a kind of standalone two-chapter sequence in a, a 19th century Italian novel, The Betrothed, which is sort of their great classic national modern epic. But in this two-section, two-chapter section, um, it, it gives a very interesting step-by-step -step map that I think is a pretty accurate representation of what happens every single time there's a major public health crisis. And one of the steps is that there's scapegoating. Some group always gets blamed. And, you know, we, those of us who are old enough remember the AIDS epidemic and the, all of the blaming that went on in the around the gay community and and other kinds of blaming were going on and so um 
Yeah, this is really old. And it's one of the things to watch for, that it's a kind of a human reaction. I think part of the problem is the ways in which we tend to make an analogy between war and plague or war and pandemic. And we import those notions about how to win. It isn't helped by the fact that American medicine is so dominated by military metaphors. And you hear them all over the news now, right? We're fighting this war against the disease. The disease is the enemy. So when we import those metaphors, one of the things we do is create enemies. And even if you say the disease is the enemy, war implies that we're looking for a human enemy to fight. And even fighting a disease is an unfortunate um, term, term, I think. We're trying to find out, we're trying to un disclose the mysteries of transmission and how disease happens, and we've gone a long way with that. But to, to make it a, a war, I think, makes us more prone to making enemies. And how, how would you uh, help those of us who are uh, really looking for a faithful way to respond to this challenge that's before us. Um, uh, maybe that's, maybe it's a personal example of how you ground yourself through this time or, uh, or, you know, things that, that we can hold on to as people of faith. Um, how, how might it actually remind us of our faith? Yeah. Well, of course, when there's so much human suffering and when there's so much fear, it, the apocalyptic imagination really kicks in, right? And people start making dire predictions about the end of the world and the end of civilization as we know it. And some of those might be right. The apocalypse is there. So I think what, what a faith narrative and a faith commitment enables us to do is look at what's happening to us from a different altitude so to speak, that we can, one of the things you have to do in a time of such widespread health crisis is take a step back and look at what's happening through a wide angle lens. Um, I wrote a piece some years ago on epidemics as epic subjects. And the idea of an epic is that it's a story about what's happening to a whole community or the whole people, the whole tribe. And so you don't you can't tell that in the way you can an individual story with an individual plot line. You have to kind of take multiple vantage points and points of view, and it's a very complicated narrative to put together. But so I think the idea of apocalypse really, and the, the faith narrative that's eschatological, that says there will be an end of time, and we don't really know what it's going to look like, but we are a people who are expecting that at the end of history, there's going to be something we will know as a new heaven and a new earth. So that's one way that faith can help is really push you out to those theological um, maps of the cosmos that most of us don't spend much time looking at most of the time. It has to make our scope get bigger. That's part of it. Seems to me that, uh, I mean, I don't necessarily recommend this for light reading uh, during this time, but I was dipping into Kierkegaard's uh, Sickness Unto Death. Uh, and uh, it, he, uh, you know, I think one of the, the, the themes there is that uh, we, we become spiritually sick as a, a, a people when we don't have hope. And kind of what you're talking about is, uh, the, the church can play a role of redefining, saying if we're not we're not going to we don't have to go back to the way things are. We don't have to recover from this, but maybe we can discover something new about our calling as a faith community moving forward. Right. right. And the other thing I think, in, in addition to the taking that large view of who we are as a people and as people of faith is to come back to some of these fundamental questions about how then are we to live as people of faith? And the first one is who is my neighbor? And I think it's really interesting for all of us in very small ways these days to keep revisiting that question. For instance, 
um, in the first days of this, when we were being told to stock up because it might be a matter of weeks, and now of course we think it might be a matter of months and we don't know how many, you know, go to the store and stock up and because we might, we're gonna probably have to isolate people and all that. So I'm in the store thinking, well, what do we need? And looking at all the people who are clearly in hoarding mode. And so some stores have now started to say only two of these items per family and so on and control that. But, but one of the impulses is to take care of oneself and one's family. And so the question of on what terms we have what we have and on what terms we share it is really important. And I'll give one very sweet illustration, which is that I sort of came late to that party. I was just not thinking about stock, stocking up. So lo and behold, when I went to the store, the toilet paper was gone. And then, you know, the spray things to clean your counters were pretty well wiped off the shelves. So I was looking at the few remaining products. And there was another woman in the aisle. And I just said out loud, I don't know which one of these is even likely to be effective. And she kind of hesitated. And then she said, well, I just took the last two bottles of Lysol spray. Would you like one of them? <laughs> so I said, no, take them home. It's okay. Well, we have things we can use. But I thought, how many people would do that? Right. And what do I need? And what do we need are sort of competing questions for people who are trying to be responsible community members. And they become just a little sharper and harder at a time like this. And, and also, I think as, as the whole economy shifts, uh, there's that danger of, of getting uh, self-centered in all of that rather than uh, generous. And there's certainly needs in our community. I know uh, uh, we, we're putting together a plan to help uh, those kids in the Oakland school system who now don't have food. I mean, the first week, this last week when they opened it up, the first day they served 22,000 people in who were hungry. And uh, so I think it, it, it's kind of a, a Eucharistic image as of breaking, breaking the Lysol package <laughs> And sharing it or, or or the package of toilet paper or something and and getting it out there to to other people and and feeling again anew a reliance on god yes to, to me that has that's sort of an opportunity that we have we spend as comfortable americans uh uh, we we tend not to you know we tend to take things in our own hands and then when they fall apart uh, where do we go? And it's just a reminder that, that there's faith to rely on. That's right. And faith doesn't mean a sort of glib, I don't have to do anything, God will take care of me. I think faith means, wow, we are in this together. We have been called into this together. This is the historical moment we get to live into. Well, and speaking of, of that, I, I don't know if you saw the projection, uh, you know, in that great Christus Victor in, in Brazil uh, and Rio de Janeiro, uh, someone projected all the flags of the world country. Oh, upon no, them. I didn't see that. It's, it's uh, to me, that's an incredible image it, it, of art, of kind of, kind of theology, obviously, mm -hmm. and uh, the, the open arms of, of Christ. Um, and and that it you know a Christus Victor in in its definition is both you know reminds us that we're kind of all there's a crucifixion happening but there's victory in it right. uh, as as well in resurrection um, but it reminded I was reminded of that when you were talking about uh, art. Um, well, also, if you doubtless seen some of the. Um the Zoom gatherings on YouTube, there's a wonderful one of the Rotterdam Orchestra, all in their own homes, being conducted by their conductor on Zoom. So you see all of them playing their instruments in their own homes, and they're playing um, the end of Beethoven's Ninth, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. They all introduce themselves. It's so sweet. And then the YouTube images of the Italian people and then the Spanish people singing from their balconies. And all of those things are, I think, 
they just lift up my heart. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that the sense that we are a people um, really becomes vividly right. alive. And after such a long period here of worldwide division uh, mm -hmm. where people have nationalism has increased and boundaries are, have become really important between people uh, for a lot of people um, uh, to see, to ex experience a challenge that has no boundaries. Yes. And, uh, you know, to say, well, we have to see this as something that doesn't have boundaries and we need to work together to, 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 um, to really move into a, a, a bright future, a hopeful future. Well, I believe it was the head of the UN this morning. We listened to so much news, I can't remember who said what, but I think he was the one who said, could we just stop making war for a while because this is all over the world. We're all dealing with it. Mm. And I, I think that appeal is an important one, that, that plague narratives often displace war narratives as a kind of dominant way of understanding the culture. Mm. And in a certain way, it takes something like this for us to reframe what we're all doing as a global community. It really restores your sense of um, that we are earthlings and we're not just members of a nation. So as we bring this episode to a close, um, I'm very grateful uh, for you taking this time. And I'm, I'm also grateful that you have offered to uh, continue next week uh, with a specific uh, focus on a biblical story about healing. And maybe you'd like to just uh, give us a teaser uh, for next week. <laughs> well, probably you've all heard the story of Naaman or Naaman, however people say his name, who was a powerful king. It's, the story is told in Second Kings. And he gets leprosy. And so it's a very interesting kind of prototypical story of the stages he goes through in coming to terms with his having gotten leprosy. And that story, like so many of the stories of plagues and epidemics, brings up the question of class and the question of privilege and the question of money and the question of who he's going to take advice from and um, questions of gender, because there's a little Israelite slave girl that's involved and she shouldn't have a voice at all, but she becomes a very important person in this narrative. And the question of crossing um, tribal boundaries and the question of what happens when um, people with great power and money are humbled by a disease that really makes them outcasts. I mean, it's just got all kinds of themes in it. It's really fun to explore. So yeah, I'm um, I'm grateful for a chance to talk to you about it. Great. Well, we'll look forward to that. And, and thank you so much uh, for being with us on uh, this episode of the Worship Lounge. You're welcome. Could I just do one PS? Oh, please. I didn't get to name very many of the actual works, um, but even if people don't want to read a huge Italian novel, the two chapters 31 and 32, and you can get them online for free, of Alessandra Manzoni's The Betrothed are a little standalone record of the plague in Milan that goes through every single stage of what, what people do. And I just think it's a wonderful, classic portrait of a plague. There are many, many others, but that's one of my favorites. Great. Yeah. Well, thank you. I'm sure uh, we're, uh, many are finding some time to read, hopefully. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, well, thank you again, Marilyn, and uh, it's such a pleasure to talk with you, and we look forward to talking some more next week. Great. See you then. Okay. Take care.